Hey everybody, it's Jake from Innocence Ministries. Thank you so much for joining me. Welcome. God bless you. Today I want to talk about who is the elect. Now this is a seriously controversial issue in the body of Christ. Um, and I'm smiling, but really it's a serious issue because a lot of people are very bound in wrong teaching, in Calvinistic teaching. And I want to come out and say right away, I'm not an Arminian uh, I'm not into the whole Arminian-Calvinist debate. You know, Arminians believe that we have free will. Calvinists believe that we don't. Um, I'm into Bibleinism. <laughs> I'm into what does the Bible say? You know, whether you're an Arminian or a Calvinist, what you need to prioritize is understanding what the Word says. And what I want to share is that the Word explains itself. When we come across a concept or a passage, that confuses us, we are called not to just quit and just say, well, I don't get that one, or even turn away because it's a concept that's so scary. For instance, you know, that Jesus only died for some and, you know, you don't have any, uh, you got no chance, man. God either chose you or He didn't. Um, you know, that'll make me want to run away. <laughs> I mean, that's scary. Uh, think of you and your kids. Would you line your kids up and say, um, Hey, little Johnny, uh, for no reason, I arbitrarily choose you to burn in hell forever. And uh, little Susie, I choose you to go to heaven for no reason. No. You want both your kids to go to heaven. Why? Because you love them and you're a good parent. We know from the Bible in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says that God is not slow according to His promise, as some men count slowness, and is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And remember, repentance is not a scary word. It just means a change of thinking or a change of mind. It's, you know, it's not some religious turn or burn, fire and brimstone term. We've got to define it correctly. John the Baptist ran around yelling, repent because he was saying, change your thinking. It's not about law following. It's about faith in Christ. Now that's huge. And we know from 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 that the will of God is for all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It doesn't say some or just the elect. It says all. So you don't have to dig long in the Word before you begin to see verses like that. And you begin to see that the actual Bible has a different message regarding God's will for salvation than the Calvinist doctrine does. Now, in order to make Calvinist doctrine work, you've got to omit, distort, uh, and take so many scriptures out of context, it's unreal. Um, and what's amazing to me is how, how tightly people will hold to that doctrine when you come with the truth that the Bible is actually way more liberating and that they can choose Jesus. Don't hold on to that doctrine tight. At least give God the benefit of the doubt that His Word might say something different. You know, just because words come out of the mouth of a preacher does not make them truth. I'm a preacher. I'm called to point you to Jesus and point you to the Word. If I say something, go check it in the Word. If any preacher, including a Calvinist preacher, says anything to you, you need to go look it up. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, He quoted Deuteronomy 6, and He said to the devil when the devil was tempting Him, He said, Man shall not live on bread alone, physical food alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, also spiritual food. We're called to feed on the Word. Now, I don't say that legalistically. The Word, your spirit, feeds on it. You have a spirit, soul, and a body, and that spirit needs the truth of the Word of God. So when you hear a preacher say something, even if it's your favorite preacher, you know, part of your calling is to make sure that that's in the Word of God. That doesn't mean you go around all day with a spirit of correction, trying to correct everybody. It just means that people miss it sometimes. It's okay. We all know in part, as Paul said, we're all growing in grace and knowledge of Christ. 
But today, what I want to focus on is not all those other aspects of Calvinism. I want to encourage you to listen to Escaping Calvinism Parts 1 and 2 on the website. They're audio teachings. They're downloadable. You can put them on your iPhone, iPod, Galaxy, whatever you want. Um, and I cover all of that. I address all of the Calvinist doctrine. And again, I'm not into the whole, I'm an Arminian and I'm against Calvinist. I am not against Calvinist. I'm pro the Word, and I'm pro Jesus, and I'm pro God's actual heart. God is a good Father. He doesn't send anybody to hell for no reason. So when you begin to understand God's will for salvation, that He wants all to come to the knowledge of truth and to be saved, and He doesn't want any to perish, you'll still see in the Word many passages that talk about the elect. And you might still wonder, who is the elect? Now, what I want to talk about today is that Jesus Christ is the elect. The elect is a singular. It is not an arbitrarily chosen group of people. It is one man, <laughs> and His name is Jesus. Praise God. This is really going to set you free. So if you would, turn to Isaiah 42. We're going to read chapter, or sorry, verses 1 and 2. So it says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. That's important. We're going to revisit that phrase. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. So first thing I want to lay out, this Greek word for elect. Sometimes in the Bible, in the Old and New Testament, it's translated precious and also chosen. It's the Greek word bahair, and it means chosen one. It doesn't mean chosen people chosen ones, it means chosen one. Now, I encourage you, get a concordance. Look up the Greek word used for elect, chosen, and precious. It is bahair, and it means chosen one. So that'll get, cause you to raise an eyebrow right there. Okay, well, I thought the elect was a group of people, but this is telling me the elect is one person. Now, look at this phrase here. I'm going to prove to you that it's Jesus. Isaiah is prophesying of the Messiah. He's prophesying about Jesus right here. He says, Mine elect, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. So, why don't you go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 3, verse 22. So, if you remember, John the Baptist knew Jesus was the Messiah because the Holy Spirit depend, descended upon him and stayed upon him. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come on people, and then he would leave. He would ascend. He would descend and ascend all the time. John the Baptist knew that the Holy Spirit was going to descend upon the Messiah and stay. So that, remember, in Isaiah 42, verse 1, it says, I have put my Spirit upon him. And he's prophesying of the elect, which we know is the Greek word bahair and is singular. He's prophesying of Christ. Let me prove it to you. So he says, I have put my spirit upon him. In Isaiah, look at uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 22. And the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. <laughs> so Isaiah 42, 1 says that God's soul delights in this elect person, which is Jesus, and His Spirit is going to descend upon Him. So, to prove it to you that Jesus is the elect, Luke 3, 22, we see that the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus, and God says, you're my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom my soul delights. Now, let's go further. Turn with me to Matthew 26. Keep your place in Isaiah if you can. We're going to Matthew chapter 26, 
verse 62. Now this is just so liberating and powerful to learn that Jesus is the elect, that the elect is singular. So, we see here in Isaiah 42, we already covered the phrase, I've put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth uh, my, he is in whom my soul delights. Now look at verse 2, Isaiah 42, 2. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Matthew 26, 62. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answer thou nothing? Are you not going to say anything? Which is it which these witness against thee? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. He didn't say a word. He didn't lift his voice. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure ye by the living God that you tell us whether you be the Christ, the Son of God. Turn with me over to Matthew 27, verse 12. If that didn't convince you, Matthew 27, 12. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against you? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. <laughs> Praise God! So we see here the, the prophecy in Isaiah fulfilled. In Luke chapter 3, Isaiah 42, 1 is fulfilled. The prophecy that the Holy Spirit would descend upon Jesus, stay upon Jesus, that this would be the one in whom God's soul delights. In Luke chapter 3, verse 22, we see the Holy Spirit descend and God declare that His soul delights in His Son Jesus. We see... In the next phrase, where it says, Jesus will not cry in the street, he will not lift his voice, we see in Matthew 26, 62, and 63, and Matthew 27, 12 through 14, that when pressed by the Pharisees and pressed by Pilate, Jesus never lifted his voice. He didn't shout a cry in the street, just as prophesied in Isaiah 42, 2 proving that He is the Baha'i'ir. He is the Chosen One. Now turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. This is so powerful. I mean, this, this alone would set every Calvinist in the world free. <laughs> right now. Um, and again, let me state, I am not against Calvinism. I'm against the teaching because it puts people in fear. It yields no freedom, no security. Um, you know, you, it, it renders you to the point where you're like, well, why do anything? Why tell anybody about Jesus? You know, I have a friend that, that actually came out of Calvinism, and he was about to serve in a Calvinist church. Um, he was about to take an internship there. And one day, you know, we had talked about Calvinism a lot, and I had taken him to the Word. You know, again, I'm, I'm all about the Scripture and what it says, not my opinion. Um, and he began to really meditate on the, upon the possibility that, that maybe that Calvinist teaching is wrong, like way wrong. And he finally just completely left it. And, and decided, yes, I can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He doesn't want any to perish. He wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And he saw it in the Word. I pointed him to the Word, and when he went to the Word, now the Holy Spirit has an opportunity to begin teaching him. Now, I'm not saying I'm a know-it-all, but I'm just saying when he began to feed on the Word of God and what it says for himself the Holy Spirit had an opportunity to, be, to begin to lead him into all truth. And he saw that absolutely not, God would never do that. You know, if God did the things, if he was an earthly father, and he did the things that Calvinism accuses, his of doing, accuses him of doing to his earthly children, God would be immediately apprehended by child protective services. He would be thrown in prison because he's a monster, because he's an animal. 
Yet we tolerate this teaching. We need to know that just because words come out of a preacher's mouth, it does not make them true. Just because words come from the pulpit, it does not make them true. That doesn't mean we go around with a ministry of error correction. How many of you know that that ministry is not in the Bible? Um, you know, to go around correcting everybody with this religious spirit of correction. Um, we're called to the ministry of reconciliation, to tell people that God has brought them near and that God says, Be ye reconciled unto me. So he began to understand these things and see them in the Word for himself. And he came to me and he said, Jake, I don't know what I'm going to do, man. If, if they ask me to minister, how do I even lead anybody to Christ? You know, if somebody comes to me and says that they want Jesus, am I supposed to say, well, brother, there's no point in asking Jesus uh, to come into your heart or, or saying that you believe Jesus is who He says He is because He either picked you or He didn't, brother. You're either going to hell or you're not. He's like, am I really going to minister to people like that? That's not ministry. And He ended up calling that church and telling them that He couldn't do it. Now, He didn't go into you know a big discussion or debate with them about it, but His heart would not allow Him to do that. So it renders you with the thought of, you know, why do anything if God's going to choose you or He's not? And that's not of God. So, if you read Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Now to Abraham and his seed, singular, were the promises made. He doesn't say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, which is Christ. Christ is the seed. Now turn down here to verse 26. For you are all children of God by faith in Christ. For as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ when you call upon the name of the Lord. And you put on Christ. You become elect. <laughs> Because you are in Christ, and He is the elect, the chosen one. Verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You are all Baha'i'ir in Christ. <laughs> And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise of the seed. Singular. Jesus is the elect. Isaiah 42, 1 and 2, Luke 3, 22, Matthew 26, 62 and 63, and Matthew 27, 12 through 14. Meditate on those scriptures. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you other places in the Bible that prove this. Or even if, I'm not, if I haven't convinced you yet, begin to meditate on these things and just ask God with a pure heart to begin to teach you. And He will. Again, I'm not saying I'm a know-it-all. We all know in part. But what I'm saying is that I can boldly declare to you with absolute certainty and just a settling in my heart that Jesus is the elect. It is not a group of people chosen arbitrarily by God for damnation or salvation. I hope you were blessed. I believe that this sets you free in Jesus' name. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Bye-bye.